Hi, this is Brenda Heindel from the Liberty Public Library in Liberty, North Carolina. I'm happy to share with you a program that we first shared in February of 2021 and then again in April 2021. And this program is going to be looking at um, a one potter in particular who was an enslaved potter working in South Carolina prior to the American Civil War in the 1800s. And then we're also going to look at other free black and enslaved potters who were working throughout the South in the 19th century. Um, but particularly, especially with the month of April being uh, National Poetry Month, we're gonna be looking at the poetry inscribed on pieces of pottery made by this potter named David Drake. So first we're gonna look at a few poems and we're gonna talk a little bit about what we do know about David Drake. And then we're going to uh, look at the function of the pieces made, as well as the making of the jars. I myself am a potter, not just a librarian. So I know a lot about pottery making. and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that, including one of the kilns where these pots were made. And then uh, we're going to look again at other free uh, black and enslaved potters who were working uh, in the South. So let's get started. So just a few poems here uh, that we see across the pieces. This is probably one of my favorite poems. Uh, I had the opportunity to work at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts, which is in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Uh, when uh, Mesda, as we fondly call it, and you might see on some of the slides, and I might use the word Mesda, uh, when Mesda reopens here in 2021, uh, don't miss the chance to go and see a Southern ceramics gallery that they have where they have a piece made uh, in part by David Drake that has this inscription on it. And the pieces themselves are really incredible to see in person. Um, and we'll get a sense of that in some of the pictures soon. Um, but really moving uh, literature on the pieces. And I think a great discussion about what is poetry and how do we see poetry and where do we see poetry? So even though it's on pottery, does that mean it's not poetry? Um, so I think it's a great conversation about where we see different phrases and where we see words and how that plays into a conversation of, of what is poetry. Another great uh, poem here. Uh, and, you know, I guess you could also argue that it's not just a poem. Perhaps it's a, a saying. Maybe these were things found in newspapers or other texts that were written down, um, but certainly a great way to look at reflection of someone's life and what they're making and the objects that these pieces are found on. And also a bit of reality. Uh, some of the um, writings on these pieces, um, most of them are jars. Uh, large jars, preserved jars, and we'll talk about that, you know, uh, have a bit of reality like this uh, <laughs> when the uh, mules and hogs uh, hang out in the bogs and then they die. So this is the jar of having the poem uh, that we saw at the beginning. I saw a leopard's uh, face and um, felt the need of grace and uh, and it's just a really um, beautiful piece to look at. It's monstrous. It's not the largest of the pieces. Um, this one is several feet tall uh, and, and quite wide as well. The two largest that I'm aware of, one is at the Charleston Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. The other is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So uh, the one um, at the Charleston Museum is roughly double this size. So there are um, quite a number of gallons. And um, I mean, this piece, when I'm standing, I'm about five foot four. This is almost up to my uh, waist. Um, and so it's it's quite large. Uh, and so the um, these jars themselves, and we'll talk a little bit more about function, these jars themselves were meant for storage storage of food, um, storage of materials, and um, we'll talk a little bit more about that function and that storage um, and those materials uh, here shortly. But David Drake um, was uh, born enslaved in the 19th century. 
and he um, was born in Edgefield, South Carolina. So we're going to take a look at the map. Edgefield, South Carolina is here, uh, sort of in western central South Carolina. Um, and so uh, quite a number, a number of hours here from central North Carolina where we are um, and kind of right on the border of Georgia and South Carolina. Somewhat out in the middle of nowhere, um, but a great location, especially in the 19th century, because they knew there was clay there. And so it's this almost like a clay highway through there. And later, once the railroads come through there, getting the pottery out isn't the problem um, and making the clay. It certainly becomes uh, an industrial site. And, and really thinking about how these potteries were operating, they really were um, large industries, uh, largely run by enslaved people, uh, making the pottery for um, for different uh, different uses. And so we see a number of different forms. I said that most of the inscriptions that we see are on jars, so um, similar to the jars you see on either end here. Um, but what's really fascinating, uh, you know, some some scholars and and people believe that David Drake, uh, as an enslaved potter, had part in making upwards of uh, forty thousand pots in his lifetime, um, and that's incredible to think about. Um, just thinking about how many hours a day of work that is, and and uh, the number of people who were also involved in the process of making pottery. Um, but uh, we see a number of different forms coming out of the different factories uh, where where he was working. And he was owned by a number of people over the decades um, through through the Civil War and and before emancipation. So his first uh, owner was a man named Harvey Drake, and that is where his last name Drake comes from. And um, Pottersville, which is was owned by Harvey Drake, was just outside of Edgefield, South Carolina. And we'll come back to Pottersville uh, because that is the location of the very large uh, kiln that was excavated a number of years ago. So you have these jars uh, that would have been made and handled and the inscriptions are usually uh, inscribed through the glaze. So glazed, inscribed, and then fired. Um, and Dave is signing his name. Um, and in the 19th century, a number of states, largely in the South, uh, made it illegal for free black as well as enslaved potters, or excuse me, not just potters, people in general, to know how to read and write. It was against the law in several states, including South Carolina. And so this very act of signing his name is um, fascinating, but also just fascinating to think about where these pots were going. These jars were largely made for uh, plantations, for plantations to hold food for other enslaved people. So not just the sayings that we see on the pieces, but also Dave signing his name in general and sharing that and showing that to other enslaved people is a really fascinating uh, dynamic to think about how that worked uh, throughout these communities. But we see David Drake first signing his name in 1840. So that is the um, beginning of the time when we see the actual signature of his name. There are a few earlier pieces that have sayings inscribed on them and that are attributed uh, to him. Again, thinking about poetry. Um, poetry is not only sentimental, but sometimes it's humorous. These are a few poems that I enjoy in the humorous side uh, that I, I pulled. Um, and uh, it's just fun to think about uh, some good rhyming, you know, kissing and fishing. Uh, and this and kiss and miss. Um, so a little bit of lightheartedness. Uh, and I think it's another interesting aspect just to think of that lightheartedness on these pieces uh, in, in an enslaved context. 
Well, this piece speaks, uh, or this poem, I should say, this poem speaks to the religious aspect of some of the texts that you'll see on uh, different jars and inscriptions. And this may speak to uh, the possibility of David Drake having learned how to read and write uh, in order to read the Bible um, and, and that religious context of, of some enslaved uh, owners uh, teaching slaves how to read and write in order to decipher the Bible. Um, and the LM uh, before Dave there on the inscription is for Lewis Miles, who was one of uh, Dave's later owners. And also the reality of David Drake's family. Um, unfortunately, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, David Drake's family was sold off. Uh, and so part of his family was taken away from him, I believe in the 1840s. Uh, and um, he was separated from them and, and never, um, as far as we know, never saw them again. Uh, and so to have this, um, very poignant uh, poem uh, or inscription on the piece from 1857 uh, is, is certainly incredible and very moving. Not just uh, a great note about how pottery works, um, the oven baking. Uh, pottery kilns were often called ovens historically um, and the pot boiling or boiling. Uh, so pottery uh, certainly has a, con a context of boiling to a certain degree while it's being fired. Um, but this also makes note of uh, who um, owns Dave at the time. Um, Miles uh, Landrum at the time was his owner at, uh, there. Here's another piece uh, looking at um, some of those jars. The jars that were used for preserving um, are, are fairly um, similar in the sense that they often have these what are called lug handles, a rolled rim, um, and this rim uh, could have been used for tying something down to cover it. Um, so what you're preserving inside of it could be protected. Um, but uh, very interesting, um, scale of glazes uh, across the pieces too. This is an 1870 census record um, showing David Drake uh, kind of there up at the top. He's 70 years old in the 1870 census noted as a farmer. Um, if you look right below his name, Mark Jones is noted as a turner. A turner is another name for a potter. Um, so David Drake uh, may or may not have been making pottery later in his life, um, but um, we do uh, believe that he likely died in the 1870s. So a little bit uh, talking about the function again. Um, this is a, a couple other um, inscriptions that we see on the pieces. Um, so these jars were sometimes used for storing meats by what's called potting. And potting means that you take a lightly cooked meat and you layer it with like a lard or a fat and then a meat and a lard or a fat. And that lard or a fat seals the food. Um, and so it keeps air from making it rancid. Uh, certainly not forever, um, but as you work down through the piece, uh, you would have different layers of food. Um, and I know that these pieces often had some sort of fat in them. I had the chance to see a collection of these pieces at a museum a number of years ago. And when the doors to the cases were open, the smell of very old fat uh, hit you. And they were sitting on these very thick special pads um, that were made to absorb the fat that was still leaching from the pottery. So really um, a, a, an experience of the senses <laughs> to, see these pieces, um, but also to know what they were being used for. And so that, again, those large jars had the intention of storing a large amount of food or pickling or salting vegetables or meats 
for a large number of slaves that would have been at plantations. So these monstrous pieces um, were used to hold food enough for a number of people um, who were uh, enslaved at the plantations throughout South Carolina and, and other places. Once the, again, once the railroads came in, these jars were moved out quite, quite a few distances. And I particularly enjoy uh, this saying here, um, again, just thinking about the manufacturing, um, but also just the note and reality. Um, it really is hard work uh, to make these pieces, um, but to put it in such a, um, a very poignant way is, is quite beautiful. So thinking about the pottery manufacturing though, um, I always like to remind people that these jars do take a lot of work and they take a lot of work in the sense that it's not just one person making them. And, and today we do know that some potters do make these individually on their own and it's possible, but historically it's very likely, especially here in America and certainly in Europe where we still had an apprenticeship system very strongly there. Um, but here in America, probably up until the Civil War, maybe a little past that, we see a lot of division of the labor. So even though you may have helped throw the pot, you may not have handled the pot. You probably didn't glaze the pot. And there were actually people who were only trained to fire kilns. And we see this through some of the scant records that are around. So there's not like a ton of records showing this, but we generally know that that probably was what was happening. And so while David Drake had a part in making these pieces, I like to try to remind people that there were probably a number of hands involved in the whole process. And so this is a great image from Witchford Pottery in England where they're showing these gigantic planters and how they make them in several sections. So some of these pots um, that were made in Edgefield, we know how to use this coil method. They're also thrown. Um, so there's a lot of different techniques used, but there's probably a lot of hands involved in the whole process too. And I just like to remind people about that. Another way to really remind us um, about how many people may have been involved in that whole process is the kiln that was excavated in Edgefield um, in 2000, I believe it was 11 and 12, uh, and actually came back and, and a few years later was excavated in another area. So this is the Pottersville kiln um, just outside of Edgefield. And so this was one of the earlier places where David Drake was working. Um, but the kiln itself, was 105 feet long. And for those of you um, that may not um, know a lot about pottery or haven't seen a lot of kilns, the quote unquote big kilns, even here in North Carolina, Central North Carolina, where there's a lot of potteries, a lot of people firing kilns, um, the big kilns really don't go much further than 30 or 40 feet. And so 105 feet is just mind blowing. And I had the chance to actually be at this excavation for about a week and to stand down at the front wall here, you see it on the screen, to stand at that front wall where the firebox would have been and look up that hill and think about where the chimney was all the way back to the end of that, that kiln is just jaw dropping. And then to think about loading that kiln and then to think about firing that kiln and the number of pieces that would have been inside of that kiln. So again, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but just the emphasis that while David Drake was involved in these pieces, how many other people also helped load the kilns and glaze the pieces. And so um, we know there are probably a number of unnamed people who were involved in this whole process and, and had a part in that. Um, and so uh, this kiln just always really um, moves me to think about uh, the number of people and to think that there was some evidence from some of the records showing that they may have been firing this kiln twice a month. 
that's just mind boggling um, to think about the amount of pottery that was being made so quickly and such a turnaround. Um, and that this really was an industry, even very, very early on. Um, and we're talking about the 1820s and 1830s, um, certainly not um, out in the middle of nowhere necessarily. They are very connected. Uh, they're on a direct trade route. Um, but still, uh, that's that's quite an industry going on um, quite early in, in the back country. And we also know about other people being involved in the process through different notations on the pots, you might say. So you see in the photograph on the left um, a piece with these notches on the handle. And so these little slash marks, and then on the right, if you look right above 1840, there's these little punk tape marks. These little uh, signs are also signs of other people working on the pieces. And there's a lot of different discussions. There's also stamps and other things we see in different parts um, of the pottery and other factories, because there were other factories outside of just David Drake's where he was owned. Um, who were doing similar uh, work and um, supporting this industry that was running through Edgefield. Um, but uh, these sort of marks are also kind of noting who did their work, who worked on this piece and who had a part in it. Um, and so they're also reminders of other hands that were involved in the process. And there certainly have also been um, a number of researchers uh, just in the last decade uh, looking to um, identify uh, people, specific names of people who were also potters, enslaved potters working in the Edgefield district. And this is just a few of those names um, that have been found uh, largely from post-emancipation records uh, noting that they were working in the potteries, um, but uh, other records uh, through deeds or other things or sales, uh, unfortunately, um, and showing uh, that they were working as a turner or a potter or working for one of the potteries. A lot of these potteries were owned um, by a white male who wasn't necessarily a potter themselves, um, but operating and owning and, and supplying the um, financial side of supporting the pottery and the enslaved potters were the ones doing a lot of the work. So briefly, I did want to show um, some other pottery that we see made by enslaved as well as free black potters um, working throughout the South. And um, this, are, this is um, a record from uh, research done at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. They have this great database online where you can actually look at historic craftspeople. Um, I highly recommend looking into it. It's really wonderful because you can actually search by um, whether the craftsperson was enslaved and whether the craftsperson was free, uh, free black. And so um, that is really neat to see all the different trades that are documented for this. Um, but through researching different potteries, uh, like the Shermerhorn pottery working in Richmond, Virginia, um, we find them owning uh, enslaved uh, people who may have likely been making pottery with them. This is a, a record from um, Lexington, Kentucky. And so even as early as 1816, um, the potter John Cardy, who was one of uh, Kentucky's earlier potters uh, working in central Kentucky, uh, did have slaves um, that were noted as potters. Um, and so we see their names, their first names here um, as Alexander Moses, John, and Jabba. Um, this is a really fascinating example of pottery um, and a rare occasion to see pottery um, made by um, potters who were enslaved prior to the Civil War. This is the Wilson family. This is down in Texas. They were enslaved potters prior to the Civil War. Once emancipation happened, uh, they continued making pottery down the road from their former owners and took the last name Wilson. So you then had two Wilson potteries. 
uh, one with uh, black potters uh, and then the white former owners um, at the other pottery. And so this wonderful dynamic, not only of uh, former enslaved potters continuing that craft, but also Texas uh, and Alabama and some of these other places uh, further west have this great blend of salt glazing and what's called alkaline glazing, the glaze that you would have seen from Edgefield coming together. And so this blend of sometimes of these clays and glazes uh, showing up and uh, beautiful, you know, very functional, but very beautiful forms um, coming out of that area. So um, a great, uh, a great example and rare opportunity to see that with the Wilson family. This is um, a piece here and some sherds uh, from the pottery of Richard Randolph. Richard Randolph was a potter, a white potter, uh, working in Virginia and making pottery for Thomas Jefferson. Um, I think it's really fascinating that Thomas Jefferson, who was a very large uh, slave owner, um, the potter who was working for him had a free person uh, making pottery uh, two feet free person, excuse me, um, the Given brothers, uh, and um, both of them were working at the time. Uh, and so really interesting connection. And again, uh, interesting dynamic to think about. And then another example here of um, the binding of someone or um, not necessarily like an apprenticeship, uh, but looking at um, Denson uh, being um, apprenticed or bound to James Duvall. James Duvall owned a pottery in Richmond, Virginia, but was not a potter himself. Uh, so here he is, uh, Denson is learning the trade from the other potters uh, working in that factory. Baltimore uh, is uh, certainly a very strong site for um, a large number of potters, both in earthenware and stoneware. And we see uh, another apprenticeship here of a young boy um, named Henry Bradford, who was working with pa Peter Perrine, who was one of the larger potteries working there in Baltimore. Even right here in North Carolina, we see the Newby family um, being uh, bound to a Quaker potter uh, in North Randolph County. So Liberty here is in Randolph County. Um, so Newby, uh, George Newby um, was working with William Dennis, who is a Quaker um, just south of Liberty. Uh, so really interesting, not only local connection, um, but knowing that the Newbies uh, did likely end up in Canada. So the movement of them from North Carolina to Indiana and then up into Canada um, and uh, being able to trace them, but not knowing whether they continue making pottery. This is another record uh, looking at uh, the newbies. Again, this is from um, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts records um, showing what that looked like um, and the uh, connections of uh, the Quakers with a free black family and the training of making pottery. If only to emphasize the need to go to MESDA or the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts is to see this piece in person. Uh, this piece was made by a man named David Jarbor. Um, David Jarbor was an enslaved potter who purchased his freedom in 1820. He continued living in Alexandria, Virginia, where he was working and made this piece in 1830, signed it, um, if you can see the inscription there on the bottom, um, and said that it is made by David Jarbor. There are a number of uh, signed pieces made by him, but this piece is monstrous. Uh, this piece standing next to me at five foot four uh, nearly comes up to my armpit. Uh, and so it's, it's quite tall, um, quite large, and, and just an incredible example of pottery making. Um, and uh, a number of sections, a lot of work, and just a beautiful piece uh, to behold in person. Heading uh, back down a little further south, a group of potters that I've been looking at in Georgia 
uh, for a number of years now. Um, we see a man named James uh, Bustle. I have Buttle there because that's the inscription that is on a piece, but his name is actually James Bustle. He was signing um, his pieces and likely trained a man named uh, Lucius Jordan. And James Bustle, I should say, was a free man, a free black potter uh, working in Georgia in the 1820s uh, through the 1840s, as far as we know. Um, and I believe and feel very confident that he trained and uh, had influence in a free black potter named Lucius Jordan. And Lucius Jordan is just an incredible story in of himself uh, because Lucius Jordan was likely passing as white. Um, so a whole nother story, um, but really another dynamic to a story of ceramics and history and the South uh, that is just um, really fascinating to take in and to think about um, and to see these pieces signed by free black or like David Drake signed by enslaved potters and uh, people who stayed in their areas and didn't necessarily move uh, move very far whether it was because they were enslaved or because they were able to contribute to the economy they lived in. So I want to just end not only thinking about poetry but also thinking about how do we tell the stories of these potters and the potters who have been documented because we don't necessarily know what their names were after emancipation. Um, and unfortunately, the potters who we saw in the records from Mesta were found because they were researching the often white potters who were owning the shops. And so there's not been follow-up research to find where those black potters went. Uh, because pottery making was a trade, a very strong trade to learn. Once you learned it, it wasn't necessarily something you just gave up. It's a lot of work to learn. Um, any potter uh, working as a, as a potter themselves would tell you that it is a very um, hard trade to learn. And so it seems like we might be able to find some of these potters who were trained um, who had been enslaved and, and it would be really fascinating to follow them if we can and try to find where they may have ended up and the work they may have been making um, or even contributed to uh, if they went further west. Um, so I just like to end with emphasizing to think about how do we tell the stories of people that we don't necessarily know where they ended up. And how can we tell those stories through the pieces that they contributed to? So poetry is incredible as verse and word, but even on objects and objects can tell such beautiful poems and beautiful stories. And so I think it's a really great reflection to think about not just how words can speak um, to people and speak to the lives of people, but also objects and things that we can handle and see in person and possibly touch. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation and um, please get in touch with the Liberty Public Library if you have any questions. Take care.